Chapter 57 A Pandect of Profitable Laws It was in the mid-1930s that someone gave me something to read by Hannah Smith, 1832 to 1911. It was a shocking experience. Was this indeed Christianity? Soon thereafter, I read the newly published God and the Social Process, 1935 by Louis Wallace, far more appealing but still disturbing. It centred, unlike Mrs. Smith, not on spirituality but on justice, which was wonderful but justice was rather vaguely defined. In the 1940s and 1950s, I read more works in both areas. Out of respect for Dwight L. Moody, who had a sense of humour, I read many Moody Colportage books, much in the vein of Hannah Whittall Smith. Recently, in reading The Bit Between My Teeth, a literary chronicle of 1950 to 1965, 1965 by Edmund Wilson, I encountered this quotation from Hannah Whittall Smith, quote, When I was young, it was considered indecent to have a baby, and I myself was made to feel as if I was a prostitute, end quote. Now, Hannah Whittall Smith was not representative of American Christianity, nor its women. She was a Quakeress of a sect which believes in the inner light, a spark of divinity in every person. Quakers represent a heretical strain, despite their great respectability with the American left. At about the same time that I read Hannah Whittall Smith, I read George Fox's journal and the life of James Naylor, co-founder of the Quakers. Nader allowed himself to be healed like Christ and Fox, as I recall it, as he approached an English town. Litchfield went into a wild, quote-unquote, prophetic frenzy and denounced it as a bloody city for no reason at all. Meanwhile, I was finding American churches to be either modernist or trivialising. I attended a lecture at one seminary to hear a famous preacher. The girl who invited me saw him as a great light in the church. It was an interesting hour. The man, a noted evangelical, was an able speaker, easily moving people to tears or to laughter, but his lecture was simply pious gush. When I told the girl what I thought of the man, she was horrified and our relationship went downhill rapidly. She saw my reaction as almost demonic, as she termed the preacher a true saint of God. I was a lonely, bewildered young man. I knew and believed the whole Bible, but on all sides I was encountering an alien faith that called itself Christian. There was something dangerous about it, I felt. I learned much later that the writer Logan Pearsall Smith, 1865 to 1946, was the son of Hannah Whittall Smith, which somehow gave me a sense of vindication because I found him so anemic a person and I saw this as the logical outcome of his mother's faith. It was not surprising that some scholars saw Christianity in its origins as another mystery religion. Certainly the churches were altering the biblical faith to the point that such an equation, however wrong, seemed possible. J. Gresham Mission effectively destroyed in that position. In the 1930s, I learned that a notable Armenian theologian had said of the atonement that its meaning was a mystery. Christ dies to save us from our sins, but... How to understand that was beyond man. At the end of the 1930s, I learned from an admiring student of his that he rejected the classic governmental view of the atonement as set forth by Anselm and Calvin because it would give a place to the law which he found untenable. I realised that to reject one aspect of God's revelation ultimately leads to rejecting all. To begin with the atonement means also to begin with the law. Can one believe that Christ died for our sakes, who were condemned by his law, to give us freedom to despise and reject his law? I could not believe that. All the same, I decided to go along with the present view until I felt sufficiently old and mature to write against it. In August 1944, I realised how totally at odds my position was with much reigning thought. I preached on Matthew 7, 24-27, The Two Foundations, Christ versus man. All that is founded on Christ endures and triumphs, while all else is washed away and destroyed. I left then for my destination, the Indian Reservation and Mission, 
at Oui, Nevada. A letter followed me from a man in the business world accusing me of defiling the faith and preaching error by preaching victory. I realized how deep the departure from biblical faith had become, and I decided, until I had matured sufficiently to be able to state my case ably and fully, to confine myself to a compliance with accepted opinion. This I tried to do for some years, not too successfully. I seemed to please no one on any side. I had learned, slowly but surely, that biblical faith is a seamless garment. Moreover, a surrender on any point soon becomes a surrender at all points. It's no pleasure being disliked, resented and maligned, but it's better than living a lie by far. It's God's responsibility to judge how far these people can go without turning Christianity into an alien religion, not mine, and I am more than content to leave the judgment to him, but it is my duty to call attention to the discrepancies. Rachel Ernfeldt in Narco-Terrorism cited Edward Schills on, quote, the antinomian temptation, the reigning credo of American's elite, end quote, the, quote, highest ideal of antinomianism is a life of complete self-determination, end quote, tradition, conventions, authorities, rules and laws are discarded, self-gratification replaces obedience and the free self replaces authority. In a variety of spheres of life and thought, antinomianism is today the reigning faith. As against this, theonomy is a powerful witness. Antinomianism replaces God's law with man's will as law, whereas theonomy sees God's law as governing men and nations. When the King James Version was first published in 1611, its preface described the Bible as, quote, a pandect of profitable laws against rebellious spirits, end quote. None would so describe the Bible today among our many church leaders. Christians then held the ancient, now reformed faith because they saw it as God's law word. Antinomianism was then very much a minor view. It is now the reigning position and we therefore have work to do.